We are continuing our study of 1 Corinthians. You can see our title. It's meant to shock, because Paul shocks. Scum of the earth. That's, that's not what the apostles are. That's what the, view, the world views them as. And Paul embraces that title and uses it to show how sometimes in this world, believers are not treated well. But they are to stay faithful to the commission that God has given them. So we see the role of the apostles today. Great story in Ernest Gordon's true account of the life of a World War II Japanese prison camp through the Valley of the Kwai, made famous in the book and movie called um, Bridge Over River Kwai. Um, The story he tells in this book is about a man named Angus McGilvery. He was a Scottish prisoner of war in the camp a camp filled with Americans, Australians, and Britons. The camp had become an ugly situation. A dog-eat-dog mentality had set in. Allies would literally steal from each other and cheat each other. Men would sleep on their packs and yet have them stolen from under their heads. Survival was everything. The law of the jungle prevailed. Until the news of Angus McGilvery's death spread through the camp, rumors spread in the wake of his death. No one could believe that he had succumbed, that he had died. He was strong, one of those they were sure would last through the war. But it wasn't the fact of his death that shocked people. It was the reason he died. The Scottish soldiers took their buddy system seriously. Their buddy was called their mucker, and they believed that it was literally up to them to make sure their mucker survived. Angus's buddy, though, was dying, and everyone had given up on him. Everyone, of course, except Angus. He made up his mind his friend would not die. Someone had stolen his friend's blanket, so Angus gave him his own. Likewise, every mealtime, Angus would get his rations and take them to his friend, stand over him and force him to eat them, again stating that he was able to get extra food. Angus was going to do anything and everything to see that his buddy got what he needed to survive. But as Angus's mucker began to recover, Angus himself collapsed, slumped over and died. The doctors discovered that he had died of starvation complicated by exhaustion. He had been giving up his food and his shelter. He had given everything he had, even his very life, for his friend. The ramifications of his acts of love, act of love and unselfishness had, startled, had a startling impact on the whole compound. As word circulated of the reason for his death, the feel of the camp began to change. Suddenly men began to focus on their mates, their friends, and the humanity of living beyond survival, of giving oneself away. They began to pool their talents. One was a violin maker, another an orchestra leader, another a cabinet maker, another a professor. Soon the camp had a full orchestra full of homemade instruments and a church called Church Without Walls that was so powerful, so compelling, that even the Japanese guards began to attend. The the men began a university, a hospital, and a library system. The place was transformed because one man gave all he had for his friend. Leadership by self-sacrificial example. What does a leader need to do to motivate other people's behavior? This Angus soldier transformed his culture through self-sacrificial example. What are we learning about the church at Corinth? We're learning that it was filled with leaders who were prideful, who were arrogant, who were focused on themselves, rather than the needs of, this, of others. And in this passage, Paul points to the true model of what it means to be a Christian leader, a self-sacrificial example, looking out for the best of others. So here's our title once again, Scum of the Earth, because Paul refers to the apostles as, in the eyes of the world, as scum, as garbage, willing to give up everything for the cause of the gospel or the message of Jesus Christ. Let me review, we always do this because Paul's got a continuing argument that's building throughout the letter, so let's review what we know so far about this letter. Remember, Paul is writing to this church. He worked in this church for 18 months. He's now in Ephesus, in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, and he hears about trouble in the church, and this trouble is divisions. Divisions in the church caused by pride in human wisdom. Pride in human accomplishments. Everyone's looking out for themselves and trying to get to the top of the heap. And it's causing great divisions in the church. 
Paul in the next two chapters, chapters 2 and 3, points out that the answer is for true Christian leaders to recognize that they are mere servants. Last week we looked at this in chapter 3. They're field hands working in the fields of a farm, and the owner of that farm is God himself. They're construction workers building the temple of God, the foundation. Paul laid the foundation. Others are building onto that onto that foundation. He says everyone needs to be careful how they, they build. And what are we building on? We're building on the foundation of Christ. And that, that, that message of Christ is the message of the cross. This foolish message to the world, which is a powerful and transforming message for everyone else, who, everyone who responds. Okay, it's a long chapter. You can see we're going to cover 21 verses, but I don't think we'll read, we won't read it all. I'm, I've taken some select verses that we'll read together to get the feel of the chapter. I'll try to read it a little slowly. My wife told me I read too fast when I do this. I get ahead of, just too excited to get to the text, right? Okay, so let's read together. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 to 21, selectively. This then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. We have become the scum of the earth the garbage of the world, right up to this moment. I'm writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, My son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord, he will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. All right. In contrast to the self-centered leaders in the church, true apostles, Paul says, are servants of God who see their role as bringing glory to him. You can see that in your outline. The first point in your outline is true apostles are God's servants and judged only by him. Now, the word translated servant here is is a word that it's not the common word for servant that Paul often uses or slave that Paul uses. Instead, it means a steward or an assistant, sort of a a second in command, a, a chief aide to the king or a manager of the household, someone who basically exists to make sure the king is, is honored and glorified and given the praise that he needs. Um, I thought of, when I was trying to think of a contemporary example, I thought of maybe the head of the secret service, right, in terms of the president. What is the head's role? His role is to serve and to protect. Everything he does is to focus on the president, make sure the president is able to accomplish the task that he's given. If you remember when when Reagan was shot, and the Secret Service men, several, I think several of them, at least one of them, got, got shot. And they were looking at the tapes and things, and they were noticing the Secret Service men never duck. Have you, noticed, you know, they're taught not to duck. They're taught to stand upright and take the bullets. They're basically, their goal is to, is to take whatever bullets are shot at the president. There's the role of the steward, basically. The, the role of the steward is to make sure they can protect, make sure they can lift up, make sure they can exalt. Because they, uh, separate from the president, they're nothing. The steward is nothing except apart from the honor and glory that's given to the leader, to the ruler. Paul uses this something, a similar imagery in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7. Very powerful. In fact, a music group, you've probably heard of Jars of Clay. There's a Christian music group. It's called Jars of Clay, taken from this very verse. Look at 2 Corinthians 4, 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay 
to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. What are we? We're clay pots, basically, Paul says. We're the, we're the outside, and inside we have this amazing treasure. This image comes from the idea in the ancient world of, of burying treasure in a pot. And, we, and these things have been discovered all over the Middle East, is these hordes of coins where someone would take their wealth, and in order to protect it, they'd bury it, they'd hide it in a pot, and then, and that, and then bury it. So what's the idea? The idea is that the message we have, the one that we proclaim, is the, the glorious one. We honor and we give glory to him. Think of the, the, again, picking up the Secret Service idea. Think of the Secret Service gets in his car that, and, and drives up. And as he's driving towards the White House, how much is that, that vehicle worth? What's the value of that vehicle? I don't know, $60,000, it's bulletproof, all that. He pulls up there, the president gets in, and he starts to drive. Suddenly, what is that vehicle worth, and what is the focus on that vehicle? You see, it's not about the vehicle. It's about who's in the vehicle. And this is, this is what Paul is trying to say. It's not so much about who they are. We tend to glorify and exalt Christian leaders. It's the one that we're magnifying, the one that we're glorifying. Notice what it says. We are entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. We talked about this before. This word is really a key word in Paul's letter. So I want to repeat this so you get it. It's the Greek word mysterion, and that's why we translate it mystery. Um, but we sometimes get, a, get the wrong idea of a mystery, right? We think a mystery, to us, a mystery is something puzzling or mysterious that we really don't know the answer. You know, um, does Bigfoot exist, right? There's, there's a mystery. People wonder, and you have the specials, or what really happened at Roswell, New Mexico? You know, was there really an alien arrival? At a, you know, these are, and, and you'll see TV specials about mysteries. Um, or for me, the biggest mystery, the biggest mystery of all is what happens to socks in the dryer, right? You know, this is, no, I'm serious. This is just crazy because there, there's no place they could go, right? They go in the hamper, they go in the washing machine, they go in the dryer, and some place between the washing machine and the dryer, they disappear. It makes no sense. And then they never come back. I don't know about, I mean, I never discover these. So, so that's a mystery in our eyes, right? At least in my eyes. That's what I would define as, as a mystery. That's not what we mean by a biblical mystery. Here's what we mean by a biblical mystery. Something unknown or over, overlooked, but now revealed in, by God. See, the Jews missed a number of things that was, they were in the Old Testament, but they missed them in terms of the proclamation of the gospel. Here's some things. We mentioned these before. I just want to remind you of them. The suffering of the Messiah, predicted in Scripture, but now revealed in all of its glory and all of what it actually meant that Jesus would go to the cross to suffer and die. Secondly, another mystery in Scripture is salvation by faith apart from works. Now, again, this is in the Old Testament. We saw it with reference to Abraham and others, that people have always been saved by faith, not by what they've done. And yet, it was misunderstood, and, and, and the Jews especially got wrapped up in a work salvation. And third, especially important for Paul, is the gospel going to the Gentiles. Salvation came through Israel. Israel was God's special chosen people. But in fact, all along, it was part of God's purpose that that message of salvation would go to the ends of the earth. So those are some of these biblical mysteries. And Paul says, we, clay pots... Just clay pots are entrusted with that message, the message the world needs. And so we, as God's stewards, as God's servants, are answerable to him alone. Here's our second point there. The servant's judge is God alone. Look at verse 2, chapter 4. Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I, carry, I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Now, what's happening here? The Corinthians have been judging Paul by human standards. Remember this? We've talked about this before. They had this image of what a, a Greek speaker should be, the great Greek orator. And they were going, ah, you know, Paul doesn't quite measure up. I'm sure Paul would be preaching a sermon, you know, and, and at the end of the sermon, they'd hold up their cards. Well, that was a two, you know, that was a five. He just, he just, he just could not do quite what they expected in terms of this great Greek oratory. Now, we tend to do the same thing a little bit. Sometimes we talk, we joke about going out to lunch after church, and what do you have? You have roast preacher, right? There's that, that, uh, you've never heard that? Come on. You, you talk about that, you, you, you poke, 
you, you discussed the message and, you know, it fell short. It wasn't quite, not quite so many illustrations. There should have been more illustrations. Didn't quite catch us the way we wanted to, right? Paul says this. He says, I don't care how you judge me. I don't care how you judge me, basically. Now, that's actually a sign of Christian maturity. I know, because when I first started speaking, and I, I still, this is still a struggle. I, I'm a people pleaser. I want, I want people to be happy with me. Most, many of us are, right? And so I would get done a message, and I would think, did they like it, you know? Did they, and, and if I felt like things were going poorly, I would, I would get more and more depressed. And then afterwards, I'd go, I'm going to give this up forever. I'm never going to, I'm never going to do it again. And gradually, I realized, because God taught me, a lot of times, I would think that was, a, that was just awful, that was horrible. And someone would come up and say, my life was tra- transformed by this. And then I'd think it just went so well, and there'd be nothing. You know, there'd be no silence, no response whatsoever. And God teaches you that it really is him, right? It really is his spirit at work, at work within us. So Paul says, I don't, I don't, I, I'm not judged by you. But then he even goes on to say, I don't even judge myself. Look at verse 3, the second half, verse 3. I do not even judge myself. There's a fine line here. It's good to be self-critical, I think. You need, to, you need to examine yourself at times. One thing I hate to do is listen to tapes of myself. Don't, don't ask me to or watch a video of myself. That's, that's just absolutely worse. But occasionally, I'll do it. I'll do it because I know it's possible to get into bad habits. It's possible to do things that you don't notice. You'd tell me, right, if I was doing things that were really, really annoying. annoying. It's, it's possible. So, so Paul says, um, or, or, or so it's good at certain times to be self-critical. But in the end, Paul says, God is our only judge. He's the one who's, who we are accountable to. We need to focus on that. So he says, I don't, I don't care how you judge me. My only judge is God. Now, now to say stop judging me, that's sort of, when, when, if, I, if I say that, think about this. If I say, stop judging me, what, what am I, I'm probably, in, that's almost an admission of guilt, isn't it? When someone says, stop judging me. So Paul quickly clarifies, notice this, he quickly clarifies in verse 4. My conscience is clear. That's why that statement is made, because he says, you can't judge me. And, and normally when someone says that, it means that someone, that they've done something wrong. And so my conscience is clear. But then he adds, he qualifies again, but that does not make me innocent. That does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Just because we think we're innocent or just because we can self-justify. How often do we self-justify? Do we say, I, it's not my problem, it's your problem. And so Paul wants to clarify there that he, he says, you can't judge me, but my conscience is clear, but still, I might be doing something wrong. God is the ultimate judge. So he adds, let's wait for his judgment. Look at verse 5. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Now, you've got to qualify that. We're supposed to judge as Christians, right? We're supposed to be discerning as Christians. But he's, he, means, he means don't condemn my ministry. Wait for the Lord. Wait until the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, each will receive their own praise from God. All right, so Paul talks, this is the talk, talking about True apostles as God's servants and judged exclusively or only ultimately by him. Now in the next section, you can see number two. He turns to reasons not to be prideful. Reasons not to be prideful there. Look at verse six. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. I have applied these things. Now, Here's, sometimes I'm a little reluctant to get into these kinds of things, but if you read the commentaries, this is a big issue, right? This is a question. What in the world does he mean? He says, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos. What's he referring to as these things that he's applied to himself and Apollos? There's two main possibilities, two interpretations, and I'm sharing them with you because it was interesting to me, right? I don't know if that'll be interesting to you. It's interesting to me. What did we talk about last week? Remember he says, I watered. Apollos, I planted, Apollos watered, but God has given the increase. He said, I laid a foundation, but others are building on it. So those are illustrations, right? They're illustrations he's used and applied to himself and Apollos in the sense that, um, that the, the 
followers of Christ are, are merely servants in his field, working, working for him. So that's what it could be. But there's something else. There's another possibility that some have suggested. And that is that he's referring to these slogans, I follow Paul and I follow Apollos. Now remember this, go back to the very beginning. What's the problem with the Corinthians? Is they're following human leaders. And some are saying, I follow Paul, I follow Apollos. That's the way we understood it. But, but some commentators say, maybe that's not just what's happening. I mean, there's divisions in the church over various leaders in the church. And we're learning that many of these leaders... Um, are, st- are still in the church and they're claiming pride and arrogance. So maybe they were saying, I follow Joe, I follow Bob. But Paul doesn't want to just slam them publicly. So instead what he says is, let me give you an example of this. I follow Apollos, right? I follow Paul. And what he really means is you guys are claiming to follow each other, these, these various leaders. Does that make sense? You understand? It's like if we were to do this, if we were to say, you know, I'm talking to you and, and, you know, you've maybe been rude to me or to someone. And I say, you know, sometimes I have to admit, I'm really rude to people. What do I really mean? You are, right? But I'm not going to name it. So if I sort of place it on myself, so some people think that's what Paul is doing, that he's placing it on himself. I've applied, now, now read, it, read it with that understanding. Now, brothers and sisters, I've applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so as not to shame you publicly and openly, right? So that's a possibility. I'm not sure which it is. In either case, though, the point is clear, and that is that all leaders are merely servants. We are merely farm workers, as Paul said in chapter 3, verse 5. What, after all, is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants to whom you came to believe. And verse 10, chapter 3. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. So we are all merely servants, farm workers in God's field, construction workers in God's temple. So that's, that's the first reason. There's no reason to be prideful because we don't own the farm, right? God owns the farm and we are merely workers in it. Turn your outline over. There's a second reason. Second reason not to be prideful is the testimony of Scripture, Verse 6, again, I apply these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Now, again, this is cryptic. The problem with Paul is they understood. They had been in dialogue with him. Paul says, you know that saying, don't go beyond what is written. What's our problem? We don't know what was written, right? We don't know what he's talking about. First of all, now in my Bible, that's in quotes. Some of your Bibles, it'll be in quotes, some it won't, because they're treating this, it's sort of set off as a slogan. And some people think Paul is quoting a slogan that the rabbis used to say. If, if you're struggling with an issue, what do you do? Where do you turn to? If you're struggling with a moral issue, as Christians, if you're struggling with an ethical issue, where do you turn to? You turn to Scripture, right? (laughs) Some of you are holding up your Bibles. You turn to Scripture. And so basically Paul is saying, let's go back, though. If you don't believe me that this is the way leaders should be, let's go back and look at Scripture. Let's not go beyond what Scripture says. In other words, let's not go into this Greek philosophy and so forth. Let's stick to Scripture. So what we need to do is we need to go back and see what Paul has quoted in Scripture in the previous passages. So essentially, I think what he's saying is don't go beyond Scripture. So what's Paul's quoting from Scripture in chapters 1 through 3. I just pulled them up for you conveniently here so you can see them. Here's verse 19. He quotes from Isaiah of chapter 1. Quotes from Isaiah 29, 14. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Chapter 1, verse 31. As it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Chapter 3, verse 19. That's from Jeremiah 9, 24. 3.19, as it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. Job 5.13, chapter 3, verse 20. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. Psalm 94.11. Those are some some of the quotes from the Old Testament that he's used. What do they all indicate? You can see it's the foolishness of human wisdom and the the wisdom, the the great wisdom of God. So don't be arrogant. Don't be arrogant because it's not about us. It's all about God. That's what Paul says. So that you will not, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will not be puffed up. 
and being a follower of one of us over against the other. So he's arguing against arrogance, and all of the Old Testament passages he's quoted have argued against arrogance, that really all that we have is from God, so we need to focus on him. And in fact, that brings us to the third reason not to be prideful. Let her see the third reason not to be prideful is everything we have is a gift from God. Everything we have is a gift from God. Look at verse 7. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Paul says, what do you have? A rhetorical question. What do you have that wasn't a gift from God? Think of that in your life. What do you have that wasn't a gift of God? And everything, everything that we have is a gift from God. Our life, our breath, every, everything that we, we have. Years ago, when Roxanne and I were in Scotland, there was a major election. This was way back in 1990 when uh, Margaret Thatcher, you probably may not even remember this, remember Margaret Thatcher, the, the great woman prime minister of Great Britain, and she was actually ousted from her own party leadership. There was a time when they felt like her leadership was shaky, and they ousted her, and so they held an election for the, for the, uh, the head of the party, the Tory party. And there were two candidates. One was a guy named John Major, and the other was a guy named Douglas Hurd. John Major, and John Major, if you know British politics, you know, became the prime minister for several terms after that. But John Major was from a working class background, you know, kind of a blue collar background. Douglas Hurd was sort of British aristocracy. And so he was sort of touting himself as having all these credentials as, as this British leader. And John Major just made one comment. Um, during, uh, during, they were having a debate, and at one point he said something like, well, you know, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth. I had to work my way into this position. And this was on the headlines from there forward, basically. And that just determined the election. Basically, Major said, I worked for what I got. And Douglas Hurd could only say, I was born with a silver spoon in my mouth. You know, because he was born into this, this aristocracy. So here's what Paul is saying. He said, how many of you got what you, you have now by virtue of, of what you've accomplished, what you've done? And everything we have, everything we have is from God. If we did nothing to earn it, how can we possibly brag about it? All right, having reminded them they have nothing to boast about, that's number two there in your notes. Paul now contrasts their arrogance with that of the apostles. Number three, you can see in the notes, contrast between the Corinthians and the true apostles. Look at verse eight, and this is where Paul gets interesting. A bit of sarcasm, you'll pick this up, not very subtly either. Verse 8, already you have all you want. Already you, Corinthians, have become rich. You've begun to reign, and that without us. You've become to reign as kings, and that without us. How I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. Okay. Well, what were the Corinthians claiming? We talked a little bit about this in our introduction to 1 Corinthians. They were claiming to have arrived spiritually. They, they were claiming to have reached this, these pinnacles of spiritual state, now superior to others. And what's the pinnacle? What's the climax of our relationship with Christ? It's when we are glorified, right? When we reign with Christ, we're going to reign with Christ. You know that? That's, that's repeatedly pointed out in the Bible, that we're going to reign with Christ. Let me show you some passages here to confirm this, will we reign as kings? Here's Jesus talking to his disciples. Now, this is the 12, but relates to all believers to a certain extent. He says, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So the 12 apostles are going to reign over the 12 tribes of Israel. Here's more about us, more specifically. Romans 8, 17. If we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. By virtue of our relationship with Jesus Christ, we are, we are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We are children of God, and so we are heirs of all things. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Third, if we endure, we will also reign with him. It says 2 Timothy 2.12. So you can see, we are, reign, we are going to reign as kings. Anyone see the Chronicles of Narnia? You know, the end of the first one, the, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. What happens to the, the four children? Four children? Yeah, four children. What happens? They end up, they're, they're, after Aslan has his victory over death, 
they reign. They become kings and queens. That's, that's the idea here. C.S. Lewis is getting that from Scripture, that we are ultimately going to reign as Christ. So the Corinthians are right in that sense, that they are going to reign as, as kings. What's the problem? Did you notice it? What, 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 what's the, the pre- predecessor? What comes before reigning? If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Oops, right? They forgot about that. If we endure, we will reign with him. So you can see, suffering comes first. Now, for a lot of Christians, we don't want that part, you know? We want to skip right to the the glory. We want to skip right to the power and the honor and the wealth. And some Christians preach that, that basically you can have all the wealth you want. That's what God wants for you. That's not what Scripture says. God wants that for you, but it's, it's, it's the ultimate goal after we pass through a period of suffering and endurance. And so Paul says, you guys are reigning as kings. How wonderful that you are, dripping with sarcasm. But we aren't quite there yet. So he talks about, he talks about the apostles. He says, I'm so glad you are reigning. We honor you. We hail you as kings. Look at verse 8, second half. And that without us, how I wish that you really had begun to reign so that we also might reign with you. We sometimes do this with our kids. They complain that they don't get enough. And what do we say? You have it so rough, you know. It's, it's so sad, you know, that you have to live in our house here. What a horrible situation. It's so sad that that you, get to, that you have to eat our food that we provide for you, that, we, that you have to receive our money and, and, and drive around in our cars, right? It's so gracious of you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for taking our money. We so appreciate that. That's, you see what he's saying? That's what he's saying. You're wonderful kings. We honor you as kings. But then he contrasts that with the role of the apostles, the apostles as condemned prisoners. Paul uses a common event in the life of of the the Roman Empire, to describe this. Two things. First, that they are brutally treated. Look at verse 9. For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to human beings. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are so strong. You are honored, we are dishonored. To this very day, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. When we are cursed, we bless. When we are persecuted, we endure it. I'll pick up the rest in a a moment. Okay, so what Paul does here, he, he, he takes this common event. It's known as the Roman triumph. You've got to understand the background. Notice what he says. God has put us, I'm back in verse 9, God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession like those condemned to die in the arena. We've been made a spectacle to the whole universe. Now, we've got to understand the cultural context here. The Roman triumph, after a Roman um, general would conquer conquer another country, he would bring back the plunders from that country. And he'd bring back, if the king was still alive, he'd bring back the king and his noblemen and his families, and, and they'd have a giant parade, essentially. And the triumphant king would go through, and he'd be all displayed in glory, the triumphant general, I should say. Soldiers and weapons would come through, sort of like a, a North Korean parade. You ever see those? You know, they've got the missiles all set up, and it's, it's meant to show the great power of Rome, the great might might of Rome. And then the spoils of war would come through, the conquered king would come through, and he'd be humiliated, his family and friends. I actually, I had to do this. I, I found a, an example of this in Roman literature. Do you want to read, me to read this? Roman literature? Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> this, this is history, and I'm just, I'm just obsessed with this, so I could just spend the rest of our time talking about the, the Roman triumph. It's fascinating. I mean, this is from Plutarch. Plutarch, a Roman historian, Um, After bringing the third Macedonian war to a successful conclusion with the Battle of Pydna, the victorious commander, Lucius um, Aemilius Paulus, returned to Rome, where the Senate and the Roman people granted him the honor of a triumph. The latter was a formal military parade in which a victorious general and his soldiers marched or rode along a prescribed route in the city. The occasion was always well attended by Romans, and the triumph involved wagons loaded with captured enemy weapons and booty to display the victory, of the, the greatness of the victory. 
prominent prisoners were also forced to march in the procession. And since the victory of Pydna had resulted in the capture of King Perseus of Macedonia, he and his children were paraded before the Roman public. In addition, the amount of money contained in the captured Macedonian royal treasure was so vast that it enabled the Roman state to abolish the property tax that Roman citizens had to pay. You should do more conquest around here, right? Okay. okay, let me read you. That was actually the introduction. Let me just read you a couple of paragraphs from Plutarch here. He says, this triumph lasted three days. So a, a three-day parade, it says, on the first, which was scarcely long enough for the site, in other words, the day was barely long enough for the parade, uh, were to be seen the statues, pictures, and colossal images which were taken from the enemy, drawn upon 250 chariots. On the second was carried in great many wagons the riches, the finest and richest armors of the Macedonians, both of brass and steel, all newly polished. So they took the enemy weapons and polished them all up to bring them through. And then they threw them together into heaps and piles to show that they had been defeated and captured. On the third day, early in the morning, first came the trumpeters, who did not sound as they were wont of in a procession or solemn entry. Next following young men wearing frocks with ornamented borders. Next to these came Perseus's chariot, in which his armor was placed, and on that his diadem, his, his crown. And after a little intermission, the king's children were led captives, and with them a train of their attendants, masters and teachers, all shedding tears and stretching out hands to the spectators and making the children themselves also beg and entreat their compassion. There were two sons and a daughter whose tender age made them but little sensible to the greatness of their misery. In other words, they're just thinking this is a prey as, as they go along. After his children and their attendants came Perseus himself, clad in black and wearing the boots of his country and looking like one altogether stunned and deprived of reason through the greatness of his misfortunes. Next followed a great company of his friends and family, whose countenances were disfigured with grief, and who let the spectators see by their tears and their continual looking upon Perseus that it was his fortune they, had, they so much lamented. Okay, so you get the idea, right? This is, this is the picture. Is, the picture is when the Romans loved their power. And you see this all through literature, and they love their greatness. And so when they defeated, especially someone who'd held out against them and defied them for so long, they, they do this, this Roman triumph for maximum celebration of, of Rome's might and then maximum humiliation for their, for their opponents. This was the way they ruled, right? This is, we've talked about the cross. The cross was a weapon of terrorism and a weapon of humiliation for their enemies. So what does Paul do? I mean, this is a shocking image. He says, by the way, you know who we apostles are? We're those guys. We're Perseus, you know. We're those guys who are being dragged along at the end, ready to be taken. Oh, and then they take them into the amphitheaters and have gladiator contests and have, have them massacred in, 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 that, in that context. This is who we are. Um, by the way, here's a fascinating one. Um, this, is, this is the triumph of Titus who conquered Jerusalem. This is on the Arch of Titus in Rome. And this, it's an amazing engraving because it was done at the time of Titus in the first century and yet notice it's got the, the, the furniture of the temple in Jerusalem. That's the menorah from Jerusalem. This is the plunder of Jerusalem engraved on a plaque. And it was, it was drawn to commemorate the triumph of Titus as he came into Rome with the captives of, of the Jews after it and so forth. Okay. I'm sorry, I got excited. I just had, yeah, yeah. I just, it, it's a fascinating historical point. So let me read that again and show you what, what he says. It seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like those condemned to die in the arena. Paul says the true role of a disciple is to suffer even, to be humiliated even, even to die. Someone else said that. Remember what Jesus said? Mark chapter 8, then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. But Paul goes beyond merely suffering for their faith. He then takes the offensive. Notice what he says in verse 12. We work hard with our own hands. Now, why is that surprising? Because the Greeks thought manual labor was degrading, right? We work hard with our hands. When we are cursed, we bless. It's not just about suffering as a believer. It's about a positive response. When we are persecuted, we endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. 
We have become the scum of the earth, the garbage of the world, right up to this, this moment. So Paul says, not only are we suffering as apostles, but when we are attacked, when we are slandered, how do we respond? How are we to respond as believers? What did Jesus say? Right? He said, when we're persecuted, how do we, we bless those who persecute? Here's Jesus, Luke chapter 6, verse 28. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. In Matthew 5, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. Paul in Romans 12 says the same thing. Romans 12, 17. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Verse 21 of chapter 12. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the most challenging part of being a Christian because we don't like this, right? We want to triumph like the Corinthians. We want to triumph now. We want to win now. And for the most part in America, we do. Right now, we're in this culture war we talk about. But in a lot of, in a lot of cases, we still have a, a strong voice in our society. And yet Paul says, hey, that's not the way it's always going to be for Christians. There are Christians around the world today who are suffering and dying for their faith. And how do we respond to that? We respond not by hating back, not by attacking back, but by loving back. Now, we do have to qualify this. There is such a thing as justice, and I want to be, be careful about that. But, but justice is always societal justice. It's governmental justice. We don't lash back personally against others. We love back personally. Now, if, if crimes are done, if evil is done, then that's the role of government to step in and to judge justly in those cases. Okay, after appealing to them by his own example, Paul appeals through his authority as a spiritual father. And this is our last point here. You can see verses 14 through 21. Paul has a, appealing as an apostle, appealing as the true role of apostles. Now he appeals to them personally as their father. Look at verse 14. I am writing this to, not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ, I became your father through the gospel. So basically, Paul says, who's your daddy? I had to use that line, right? Yeah. Now, the word for guardian is a very interesting one. In a wealthy Roman household, the children would basically be raised by a guardian. This is a technical word for that. A child minder who would take them to school, who would work them through their lessons. It was like a nanny, basically. Paul says, you've had many nannies, right? You've had lots of people helping you grow spiritually, but you only had one father. You only had one person who gave you birth, and that was him. He's talking again about the foundation of the church. Now, then he goes on to talk about a father's role. There's really two main roles he talks about for father. And I think in many ways they apply to us today. A father is a model, right? A father is an example of how to live. That's the first role. The second role is the father is a disciplinarian to guide and shape the children. So that's what he talks about in the next two points. You can see the call to imitate him. Here's the model example. Verse 16. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me, to imitate me. Now, Paul uses this all the time. Paul, throughout his letters, he says, follow my example. When we first read that, it almost sounds arrogant, doesn't it? Follow my example. Imitate me. But look at what he says in, I, in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. We'll get to this in a second. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. There's a great model for Christian discipleship for all of us, right? How do people learn? People learn not by reading manuals for the most part. Not, but they, they learn by watching others. They learn by watching and following the example of someone else. And Paul knows that. This is the best way to, to learn. This is why we talk about mentors, right? Mentors or discipleship. Because the, the best way to learn is by following the model of others. And Paul says this again. I just had to overwhelm you with it. The, he says it so much. Look at Philippians 3.17. Join together in following my example. Uh, Philippians 4, 9, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, learn from me. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. Paul knows the best way to learn is to follow the example of others, to watch, watch others. You can learn by listening, you can learn by reading, but the best way is to see an example for others. And we know as parents, right? How often this is the case. What are our children going to learn from most? 
what we tell them they have to do or what we actually do, right? They watch us, they see us, and they, they learn from what we actually do. So Paul talks about his example among them. Then he says, I'm going to send Timothy to remind you of this. For this reason, I've sent to you Timothy, my son, whom I love. He's probably carrying the letter, actually, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church. Now, you're running out, we're running out of time, but I have to show you this, because Timothy, as we know, was rather timid in his personality. He was a very gentle soul, really caring and loving and, and, and all, but he was, he was not a terribly assertive person. And Paul says, I'm going to tend Tim, send Timothy to you to remind you of the things you should be doing. Turn to chapter 16. I don't know if we did this before. But Paul reminds them in chapter 16, just before the end of the letter, that he's sending Timothy. I'm in chapter 16, verse 10. When Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord, just as I am. Paul knows Timothy's personality. He says, and these, I mean, these, these Corinthians eat leaders for lunch. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're just this, power, this strong and forceful group. And then he goes on to say, no one then should treat him with content. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I'm expecting him along with the brothers. If you eat Timothy, I'm going to know it. If he doesn't come back to me, I'm going to know it. So, so Paul gets stern. And now he, he gets stern after in this passage as well. He says, he says, follow my example. As your father, follow my example. I'm sending Timothy. To, if you don't remember what some of those things were when I worked with you for 18 months, I'm sending Timothy. But if you don't listen to Timothy, if you don't follow my example, then here's his upcoming visit. Let me just read the rest of the passage. Some of you have become arrogant, as if I were not coming to you. But I will come to you very soon, if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a rod of discipline, or shall I come in love and with a gentle spirit? See what he says? He says, Daddy's coming home. I don't know if this ever happened in your house where mom was going nuts. The kids were just going crazy and driving them nuts. And finally, she called dad. She said, you got to come home, right? And then she turns to the kids and she says, Daddy's coming home, right? And there's two things we could do when he gets home. Either we could go for ice cream because you've been so good, or Daddy's going to discipline you, right? Now, we, you know, this is not a very politically correct. How am I coming, right? In this context, corporal punishment was very, very, very common. He says, shall I come with a rod? Shall I come with a switch? Shall I come to discipline you or shall I come in love? Should we go out for ice cream and celebrate how well you're doing or do you need spiritual discipline? Then he talks about power, right? The spirit's power. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but, but of, of power. Probably the power of the proclamation of the gospel. Again, not very politically correct in our context, but discipline is missing in our society. And I'm not necessarily talking about just corporal punishment, I think. But we need to discipline our children. We need to give them boundaries, don't we? And, and that's, that's what Paul's talking about. For my kids, they'd rather, I mean, I'd never spank my kids because they just have never needed it. They're just perfect kids. But, 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 but they, don't, they would not care about that. If I take away their iPhone, that would be 10 times worse. So, you know, you can, there's, there's other ways to do discipline than, than corporal punishment. I better not go there, shall I? Okay, we've got a takeaway, one takeaway here, because we need to have some a few minutes for questions. While human leaders tend to seek power and influence, true disciples of Jesus are humble servants seeking to honor God and to build up others.